Hello, friends. Uh, you know, I have to say this is this is kind of a first for me. Uh, you know, I've been interviewed more times than I can count due to my background in drag racing and bobsledding and through my work with uh, several charity and nonprofit organizations around the world. You know, I, I'm also a corporate keynote speaker. And I have to say that after setting up all this recording equipment, you know, the lights, the cameras, the microphones, getting it all tied into the recording programs, I have a whole new level of respect for the technicians that had been behind the scenes in all those events that I've done over the past 20 years. Uh, you know, my hats off to, to, to you men and women. This is actually my second time trying to record this video. Uh, so I'm going to cross my fingers and hope it goes well. But as a published author, you know, I, I have three books on the shelves and I've never really sat down to talk about one of my books until now. Um, you know, I recently received a question from one of my readers um, that, that made me think about sharing this video with you. And she asked, you know, why did you write this last book? And to be honest, it's a great question. You should ask it of any author that you meet. You know, they're going to be very passionate, obviously, about the book that they wrote and the subject that they wrote on. Um, you know, uh, uh, there's thousands of books that hit the shelves every day. You know, a lot of them fall into the fantasy or romance or self-help categories. But some of us that are authors, occasionally we get to do something really special and we get to write about heroes. And for me, I didn't get to write about just any heroes. Um, I got to write about the 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment in World War II in my last book, When Angels Fall. Now, this was a group of young men. Most were barely out of high school. Uh, they answered their nation's call and they put their lives in the line to defend freedom in World War II. By the war's end, I found out that nearly two-thirds of the boys, really, in my book uh, had been killed or had been wounded. And those who did make it home often carried scars with them for the rest of their lives. Now, they were known as the Angels, and the 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment, or PIR, it formed at Camp Tocoa, Georgia in January of 1943. Now, if Camp Tocoa sounds familiar... Uh, maybe because you've read Stephen Ambrose's book, Band of Brothers, which talks about the history of Easy Company of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment. Uh, or maybe you saw the HBO miniseries of the same name. Now, the commanding officer of the 511th PIR was none other than the legendary Colonel Oren D. Hardrock Haugen. At age 36, Haugen was one of America's earliest parachute officers and he was highly respected and well-known to be a very capable commander. In fact, retired Brigadier General Henry Mueller, who was one of Colonel Haugen's best friends, he told me that Oren was the perfect soldier. Haugen graduated from West Point in 1930. He ran cross-country there, and he actually ranked third in his class, but he later said that he disliked his time at the point. Now, Oren then bounced around to various posts, and he played polo for the Army, before the summer of 1940, when the Army asked for volunteer officers to undergo experimental parachute training at Fort Benning. Remember, the whole airborne concept was new at the time as far as the development of it goes in the United States. But the adventurous Captain Haugen leapt at the chance. He actually jumped on his first day there with America's inaugural parachute infantry battalion, the 501st PIB. Now, for a time, Oren commanded Able Company, then served as a battalion commander and later executive officer in the 502nd uh, PIR under the legendary Colonel James Gavin. And as one of America's first officers to become jump certified, Oren Haugen served alongside some of the most recognizable names in airborne history. And this includes William Miley, William Yarborough, Robert Sink, William Ryder, and Benjamin Vandervoort. Now then, in, in the fall of 1942, Airborne Command assigned the well-qualified Haugen Command of the new 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment, which, as I mentioned, was going to form at Camp Tocoa, Georgia in early 1943. Now, ever the professional soldier, Colonel Haugen was determined to have the best regiment in the Army. He set extremely high standards to get into the 511th. Volunteers who arrived at Camp Tocoa well, they first had to stand nearly naked in front of an acceptance panel made up of officers who assessed their physical and mental qualities. And then those who passed the bar, as it were, well, they also had to participate in, in uh, fitness tests, which included 
timed runs up and down the famous Mount Curahi there at Camp Tekoa. Now, the, the volunteers uh, for the 511th, they also had to pass the Army's general classification test with a score of 110 or higher, which some of you might know was the same requirement to get into officer candidate school. And as one paratrooper said, the uh, 511th was looking for men smart enough for officer candidate school, but dumb enough to jump out of a perfectly good airplane. Now, most who tried failed to make it past Colonel Haugen's strict requirements, and they were sent off to other units. Now, this caused a problem. The inspector reports about the 511th 75% washout rate worried Washington. So the War Department, they sent a message to Colonel Haugen saying that his, his uh, entrance requirements were too stringent. It was taking 12,000 men just to fill 3,000 spots. They wanted him to lower his standards. Well, Colonel Haugen, when he got the message, he knew that he had already filled those slots, so he just laughed, and he told his staff, they're too late. By the time Hard Rock's highly qualified 511th PIR sailed for the Pacific Theater in May of 1944 as part of the 11th Airborne Division, um, they had managed to, number one, help prove the validity of airborne divisions as a whole during the Knollwood maneuvers in December of 1943. They had also set high marks with 86% of the 11th Airborne uh, earning the expert infantryman's badge at Camp McCall, and the men of the 511th were very proud of that fact. Also, they achieved a unique record um, where 100% of the regiment earned their jump wings at, Camp, uh, at Fort Benning. Excuse me. Uh, not a single one of Colonel Haugen's men refused to exit the door during jump school. And lastly, well, the 511th left a reputation as, I guess we would say, serious fighters. Um, they'd gotten into, into fights with nearly every tanker unit at Camp Polk and later every engineering unit at Camp Stoneman. Um, the army was ready to send them on their way, but clearly Hard Rock's men were ready to take the fight to the enemy. So after six months of theater training at Dobadura, New Guinea, uh, Colonel Haugen's men sailed 2,100 miles north to Leyte to take part in Operation King II. And it was here in the, in the jungles and mountains of Leyte that the 511th highly trained paratroopers first met the enemy. 33 days later, only 60% of Hard Rock's men would walk down out of those mountains. Of the roughly 2,200 paratroopers who landed on the island, 409 would become casualties. Now, my grandfather, the good-looking First Lieutenant Andrew Carrico, he fought with the 511th Company D, and uh, he later said that the awful bloody battles fought on Leyte were regarded by the officers and men as the toughest of the division's fights. He continued, the troopers who later waged bloody battles for Nichols Field and Fort McKinley and who used bayonets to assault hill positions in rock caves on Luzon claim that Leyte was the worst. And one unnamed paratrooper in the 511th, he later said, after Leyte, hell was a vacation. Now, it was on this island that Hard Rock's regiment formed the tip of the 11th Airborne's division spear that was set into the jungles uh, to, to engage and destroy Japan's 16th and 26th Infantry Divisions. And if you know your history, it was the 26th Division um, that had captured Corregidor in early 1942 and then forced its defenders to endure the infamous Bataan Death March. When the, when the 511th arrived on Leyte, Japan's 26th Division had roughly 20,000 men. And then when the 11th Airborne Division came down out of the mountains uh, between Christmas Day and December 31st, the, uh, the 26th Division only had 200 soldiers left. The Angels had exacted their revenge on the Butchers of Bataan. Now I'd like to read to you a selection from my book, When Angels Fall. And, and these are some stories that, that highlight and, and, and really paint a picture of what the Leyte campaign was like for the 511th PIR. Um, I hope as you, as you listen to these things, you'll, you'll try to picture what it was like for these boys, um, you know, 18 to 22 years old, who were sent into combat and endured the environment and the enemy. On December 12th, Baker Company experienced the regiment's most vicious bonsai attack to date. 
Guarding the northwest perimeter on Hard Rock Hill, the paratroopers were assaulted at 1730 on all sides. Watching the brutal fighting, First Lieutenant Robert S. Beitler of Regimental S2 turned to his good friend, First Lieutenant Foster Punchy Arnett, and said, God, now I know how those guys felt on Bataan. The two lieutenants then saw the platoon leader for HQ-1's 81mm mortar squad order his men to withdraw, shouting, Come on, let's go, they're overrunning us. Between 15 to 20 mortar men scrambled out of their foxholes and, and headed for the safety of the CP. Their withdrawal left a huge gap in the lines, so Lieutenant Arnett immediately rushed down to the hill, alone, towards the fleeing men with whom he had previously served. Exposing himself to enemy fire, Arnett shouted, Get your asses back in those holes. When Private First Class Harry Laboucher cried that he did not have a weapon, Arnett tossed him his personal forty-five, a gift from a friend who had served in World War I. Lieutenant Arnett's courageous charge turned the men around and they held the line. Foster later said that Punchy killed ten of the enemy before his right arm was shattered when a Japanese knee mortar exploded in his face. While it was feared that the 511th's boxing coach would lose the arm, the surgical skills of Captain Thomas Nestor, who was suffering from dengue fever at the time, saved it. Punchy Arnett was evacuated back to the States after the Angels came down out of the mountains on December 24th and 25th. Punchy made sure his trusty 45 went with him. When Fox Company's Tech Sergeant Harold Spring was nearly cut in half by a Japanese machine gun burst to the stomach, Private Ernest Coop and Corporal Louis Vane risked the same enemy gunner to pull their wounded friend back into the jungle. Spring's squad thought the eviscerated sergeant must be dead, but the medics declared him alive. Captain Charles Morgan ordered a litter made from a poncho and bamboo poles, and Harold was carefully carried to the rear, where the second oldest man in the regiment, Captain Thomas Nestor himself of Providence, Rhode Island, went to work. After asking that a trench be dug to safely work in, and to bury Harold in case he died, Dr. Nestor made an incision, scooped out Sergeant Spring's viscera, placed them in a bucket, then stitched the bleeding black holes, and then he put everything back in place and closed the incisions, all under a poncho held up by Sid Solomon of the 221st Airborne Medical Company, as Harold's friends held vigil nearby. It was just another example of Nestor's incredible skill, which the angels came to respect deeply. Harold Spring was wrapped in a blanket, and before Dr. Nestor went to work on his next patient, Private Coop and Corporal Vane anxiously asked what Harold's chances were. Not one in a million, the tired doctor replied. But the next morning, a detail came to bury Spring, but to their surprise, Harold was still alive. To the delight of his buddies, Harold Spring survived his wounds and the war. Months later, Spring sent Captain Nestor a Captain Marvel comic book cover as a thank you. Now three weeks into their jungle campaign, the Angels, whose meals had already been sporadic, began to fully face the curse of forward operators, hunger. Lieutenant Colonel Norman Shipley, who commanded 2nd Battalion, radioed Colonel Haugen to say, We have been dropped no rations today. We are eating our last meal tonight. My grandfather's friend, Sergeant Ed Sorensen, said, We rationed our food. First day, one meal divided between two men. The next day, one meal for five men. The last day for our platoon, I remember dividing two meals between thirteen men. My grandfather said we were a long time without things to eat. We only carried a three-day supply of K-rations as we, as we started into the mountains. We went a whole week and nothing. Nothing to eat. D Company's commander, Captain Stephen Cavanaugh, said, One of my greatest tests was when I was offered to swap 3D ration bars for my jungle sweater. When D Company's Private Billy Pettit and PFC Leroy Richardson were issued their last D ration bars, Pettit cautioned his friend to save half for the next day. Sitting in their outpost, Richardson thought about their platoon sergeant, Tech Sergeant Albert Barrero, who was killed the day before, and replied, Hell, Billy, I may be dead tomorrow. They both shrugged and ate their bars in one shot. When asked about what they did to survive, my grandfather said we ate anything we could find. Dogs, roots, potatoes. When you're hungry, you'll eat anything. Hunger was a constant gnaw in our stomachs. The men passed the time talking about what they wished there was to eat. 
hamburgers, ice cream, apple pie, a good steak, mom's fried chicken. Several had dreams about eating meals back home, and the starved paratroopers at Mahonag paraphrased Corregidor's 1941 defenders saying, no papa, no mama, no uncle Sam, no ammo, no oil, no can of spam. Decades later, in 1999, my 82-year-old grandfather wrote, being hungry is the worst feeling I have ever experienced, and I hope that none of you ever have to go through that. Then with a laugh, he also said, I remember sharing a foxhole with my platoon sergeant one time, and I looked over at him and thinking, I wonder how he tastes. The rat's ass charge. At 1900, Captain Stephen Cavanaugh was notified that D Company would effect a frontal assault the following morning, December 22nd. Rusty was also informed that the trail leading up to the enemy positions was narrow and densely forested, and with night's darkness now upon them, no reconnaissance could be made. With far too little information for his taste, Rusty left Battalion HQ. We were issued three K rations, and I ate all three that night, said Private First Class Charlie Jones. ENF companies had the hell knocked out of them. I thought, why save them? A few hours later, as a morning rain fell, Scout PFC David Vaughn led 1st Platoon across the line of departure at 0400, while the rest of D Company hung back. Breaking into squads, 1st Platoon quietly scaled the trail to roughly 200 yards from the enemy's suspected positions, pausing to fix bayonets and recheck their rifles, machine guns, and ammo. Under orders for silence, the Angels shared nods of good luck before 1st Squad wheeled left off the trail while 2nd Squad headed to the right. As dawn crept through the heavy clouds, 2nd Squad noticed a Japanese sentry at the edge of the field 15 yards away. Everyone crouched silently as Scout Private Sepulveda of El Paso, Texas snuck forward, bayonet at the ready. But when the enemy turned and noticed Gilberto, Slick shot him, which drew the attention of the sentry's comrades. Slick fell with their opening volley. Hearing shots off to his right, my grandfather bellowed D Company's catchphrase, Rat's ass, which signaled 1st Squad to throw grenades and hit the dirt. Explosions shattered the morning air as 1st Squad engaged the startled Japanese on the left. 2nd Squad's private 1st Class John Batori of Brooklyn, New York hurled phosphorus grenades on the run to burn enemy positions on the right, and all the excitement, the 6'2 machine gunner ran into a tree branch which smashed his nose and sent his helmet tumbling. Eyes blurry from the pain, John failed to notice the Japanese soldier six feet away drawing a bead on his head. Luckily, Private Augustus Wilder saw him and dropped the enemy. Pressing up the hillside, the firefight grew in intensity, and my grandfather and Captain Kavanaugh realized that besides the expected main line of resistance, 1st Platoon's 35 Angels had stumbled onto a Japanese column of around 150 soldiers on a trail 10 to 15 feet wide. Full of adrenaline, Private First Class John Batori shook off the stinging pain from his damaged nose and asked for a full belt for his 30 caliber machine gun, which Private Stevenson helped load as bullets zipped overhead. John then slung his 30-pound Browning light machine gun on webbing over his shoulder. Grabbing the barrel with his asbestos mitt, Batori charged, shouting, Banzai, rat's ass, who is with me? First platoon watched the exposed bad soldier Batori fire a burst from the hip at 400 to 550 rounds per minute. With decaying jump boots and rotting uniform exposing jungle ulcers on his legs and body, John's charge galvanized the platoon into performing a bonsai charge of their own. Batori was a soldier that was a great soldier in combat, but he wasn't worth a damn in the everyday, Grandpa laughed. He was always in trouble, but Grandpa added, John really showed his mettle on Hacksaw Ridge. He came through. Inspired by Batori's charge, 1st Squad on the left, led by my grandfather, 1st Lieutenant Carrico and Sergeant Taylor, and 2nd Squad on the right, led by Staff Sergeant George Cushwa and Private 1st Class William Dubes, all began a trotting marching firing line up the hill, and they decimated the Japanese column in defensive positions on the ridge. Cushwa had helped evacuate the wounded to the rear, then hurried back to lead 2nd Squad, and for his daring leadership, my grandfather recommended the staff sergeant from Roxboro, North Carolina for the Bronze Star, saying he was a hell of a nice guy. Inspired by John's charge, the angels rushed forward with shouts of, Rat's ass! Banzai! Haba Haba! 
Private First Class Charlie Jones of First Squad remembered watching panicked Japanese soldiers diving off the ridge. He said it was like shooting rabbits in heavy brush. Captain Kavanaugh noted that this forward surge by the company continued for two or three hours, with the enemy running in desperation but losing the race. A note in the regimental journal simply says, First platoon of D Company pulled a rat's ass charge on the Japs at dawn. The Japs haven't stopped running. With rain falling, first platoon moved into the retreating enemy's former positions. Enemy dead lay everywhere, and some were still twitching as the paratroopers kicked dirt over the corpses at the bottom of the troughs. Grandpa later recalled, I estimated we killed over 300 that day. Listening to reports of first platoon's effective route on the ridge, Colonel Haugen turned to his staff and said, Tell General Swing we will have the trail to Ormok Bay open for him today. As you can see, Leyte was a brutal and bloody no-front, no-rear campaign. Operating as ground infantry, the 511th PIR endured bonsai assaults, they attacked reinforced enemy positions, they, uh, they endured tropical illnesses, monsoon rains, and they described looking for snipers in every tree as the enemy would appear out of the fog like ghost in the darkness. The mountain trails they, they moved on were slippery from from the monsoon rains and, and it made resupply nearly impossible in that weather. Most of the paratroopers endured at least seven days without food in the mountains and they described nearly freezing to death at those high elevations. But they stood firm. You know, Captain Stephen Cavanaugh, who again served in the 511th, he, he later became commander of the Studies and Observations Group in Vietnam which some of you might know is the precursor to today's modern special forces units. He said, morale remained exceptionally high, and the men accepted the conditions with few complaints. I expect that all of us felt that these were the conditions that we had been trained to endure. Now, overall, the 11th Airborne Division systematically eliminated 5,760 of the enemy as they pushed over Leyte's mountains from east to west, and in doing so, Colonel Haugen's 511th PIR did what no other Allied unit had been able to do, and that was destroy Japan's main supply route on the island and seal off the Ormuk Valley. Major Edward Flanagan of the 457th Parachute Field Artillery Battalion, he wrote, Other units had maintained, after actual attempts, that the central ranges were impassable and military operations could not be conducted in the area, and he added with some pride, we proved otherwise. For their heroic efforts, the 11th Airborne Division was awarded 69 silver medals, 6 soldiers medals, 90 air medals, 138 purple hearts, and 240 bronze stars, most of which were awarded to Colonel Haugen's 511th PIR, which suffered 75% of the division's casualties on the island. And when Colonel Haugen's men marched down to the sea on Christmas Day of 1944, most were sick from one tropical illness or another, including Hard Rock himself, who was suffering from dengue fever. Nearly 250 men had to carry 2nd Battalion's wounded alone. Others were helped down the trail through the morning fog. Uh, you know, their uniforms were in tatters. Their, their beloved jump boots were just rotting apart because of the jungle environment. Uh, you know, their, their, their hunger-strained bodies were covered in jungle rot. They'd only been resupplied 11 out of 33 days in the mountains, and one company commander testified, we came out on the other side of the island, a pretty well decimated regiment. But as they walked down towards Lady's Western Beaches near Ormuk, one trooper at the front of 2nd Battalion's column began to sing, O come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant, O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem, come and behold him, born the king of angels. Other broken voices soon joined in, and the angels together praised their God on the hills of Leite as they sang, O come, let us adore him, O come, let us adore him, O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Tears fell down the grime-covered cheeks of boys who had been quickly aged by combat, even the most battle-hardened man in the regiment could feel the warmth of that special experience. Now, my grandfather, when we, when we read those words, 
uh, told him that story, he, he just quietly said, I remember. The famous television writer Rod Serling, who served in the 511th Demolition or Suicide Squad, you know, he later wrote, Someone had transformed the world. We sang as we led the wounded by the hand and carried the litters and looked back on the row of homemade crosses we left behind. It had come indeed, the holy day, the day of all days. It was Christmas. The angels had been given a difficult task, to assault the enemy's main supply route and reinforce positions in the mountains, and they had achieved every objective they were given with incredible proficiency. Not only that, they had done so while facing, as I've mentioned, monsoon rains, enemy infiltrations, um, freezing nights, tropical diseases, poor resupply, inadequate medical facilities, and, and, and so on and so forth. You get the picture. As Regimental Sergeant Major Frederick Thomas declared with some well-earned pride, he said, the 511th withstood combat experiences in the mountains that would have ruined an ordinary army unit. So what allowed them to press forward despite those obstacles? Well, in, in my opinion, to use a phrase that they would have been familiar with, it was simply true grit. Howe Company's Private First Class Richard Dick Keith, who later retired a major general, he wrote that the glue that held the regiment together was the strength of character of the men. It was their cohesiveness, their discipline, and their love and respect for each other. Add to this the word courage, the ability to go out day after day, attacking the enemy, fatigued but strengthened in their resolve to defeat the enemy, and eventually get on with their lives. Now, Captain Stephen Cavanaugh, who commanded my grandfather's dog company, he said, this was a professional, well-trained regiment with a commanding officer who set an example for all of us to follow. Now, the angels would go on to follow that commanding officer, Colonel Oren D. Hardrock Haugen, during the battle for, for Luzon, uh, where the 11th Airborne Division as a whole helped liberate Manila and then southern Luzon, and they were awarded two medals of honor, nine distinguished service crosses, one distinguished service medal, 10 Legion of Merit medals, 326 silver stars, over 1,100 bronze stars, 27 air medals, and 884 purple hearts. Now I share those numbers with you, not as any sort of hero worship, but more to help paint the picture to help you really understand the, the quality of the men who fought in the 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment. Um, many of the troopers that, that I got to talk to, they told me repeatedly that the world knows everything about the Band of Brothers, uh, you know, Easy Company. Everybody knows about Easy Company. But nobody knows about the Band of Brothers of the Pacific. Nobody knows what we fought for. Nobody knows about my buddy that I buried in the soil outside Manila. Um, when you hear those stories from these old veterans, it just it tugs at your heartstrings. And it, and it made me want to do even more to get their stories out there. The 511th PIR uh, has an incredible legacy. It was a legacy that was well known to General MacArthur. Uh, actually, General MacArthur requested that the 11th Airborne Division be the first unit sent into Japan at the war's end, and they did so when they landed at Itsuki on August 30th, 1945. After guarding the departure docks for the official surrender ceremony uh, three days later on September 2nd, the 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment would go on to perform occupation duty for another three and a half years. But the regiment's beloved commander, Colonel Oren D. Hardrock Haugen, would see none of this. Colonel Haugen would be wounded on February 11th, 1945, during the battle to liberate Manila. Eleven days later, the original Hard Rock of Tokoa would die while he was being medevaced to Indonesia. This was just one day before his regiment performed their well-known and famous raid on the Los Banos internment camp, uh, wherein the angels liberated 2,100 plus men, women, and children from behind enemy lines. It was Hard Rock's legacy of leadership and his demands for excellence that made the 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment the superb unit that it was, both in combat and also during the occupation of Japan. It's no wonder that in 1998, Japan's ambassador to the United States, he wrote to the men of the 511th and he said, I firmly believe that your gallant peacekeep peacemaking efforts, sorry, 
after the war have contributed tremendously to the current strong mutual reliance between the United States and Japan. Perhaps General Robert L. Eichelberger, who was the commander of the U.S. 8th Army, of which the 11th Airborne was part of for a time, uh, he said it best that as far as the 511th goes, no one could have asked for finer fighting men. So to answer my reader's question as to why I wrote When Angels Fall, it was because these men were heroes and their story needed to be told and retold and retold again. Whenever free men and women anywhere stop to think about the liberties they enjoy, I hope they remember the words of one individual that the 511th uh, rescued during the war. This individual said, Thank God for the angels. When I told the last living original members of the regiment that my book, When Angels Fall, was going to hit the shelves, several became emotional, and they simply said, Thank you. Thank you. Now the world will know what we did over there. Now the world will know the sacrifices we made for them. If you would like to learn more about the men of the 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment, uh, just hit the subscribe button. Make sure you click on that notifications bell as well uh, to receive updates on future videos that we have. We have quite a few things planned for the future, including some interviews, so stay tuned. I also invite you to visit the regiment's historical website. Now that's at www dot 511pir.com. You'll find exclusive content on there, uh, interviews, uh, wartime letters, maps, uh, photos that have never been released before from the war, um, and, and, and more. And if you would like a copy of my latest book, When Angels Fall, which covers the full history of the regiment during the war, um, you can find it in the 11th Airborne store online, uh, Camp Tacoa, uh, the museum there in Georgia, on Amazon, or really wherever military history books are sold. The full title is When Angels Fall, From Tokoa to Tokyo, the 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment in World War II. This book was truly a labor of love to write, and it was and is a pleasure to interview and befriend these incredible veterans, and I consider it a great honor to help carry on their legacy and share their story with the world. So if you'd like to help in that effort, please share this video in your social media outlets and let's, get, let's spread the word about the 511th. So that's it. Thank you for stopping by today. And if you have any questions about the 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment or the 11th Airborne Division, uh, just leave a comment below uh, or you're welcome to contact me via the regimental uh, historical website, um, which you can see the link right in the corner. And uh, I'll do my best to get back to you as quickly as possible. So my friends, best wishes. Please remember, there is always hope and airborne all the way.